where he discovers the, these manuscripts and it, it will tell you as more than I can about Mycroft and Sherlock and the relationship between them. I pulled back the wire trap that held the typescript flat in the bottom of the box. There were close to a hundred pages, loosely fastened through a hole in the top left hand corner by a piece of cord with a metal stay at each end. The first page was blank. The second was a title page. A single row of capital letters across the middle of it read, The Confessions of Mycroft Holmes. The name alone was like a spark igniting a gunpowder trail of associations in my brain. Mycroft is Sherlock's older brother. That's a fact. A fictional fact, in the sense that Arthur Conan Doyle invented him, rather than Patrick. Mycroft is mentioned in only a handful of Doyle's stories, and there's something troubling about his absence. Nothing really explains Mycroft. He's superfluous to the stories. That's what's so interesting about him. He's not created for a reason. He doesn't have a function in the plot. He's there because he's there, vivid and unnecessary, like all the best things. He's extra, the imagination's tip to the reader. And as fictional characters go, there is less of him than most. After all, what is a character in a book? Four facts, a speech impediment, boss eyes, a fluffy moustache from a box of costumes. Mycroft is empty, but it's a pregnant emptiness. And Patrick had seen something moving there, something that reminded him of himself. Doyle portrays Mycroft as an indolent genius, with more natural aptitude than his younger brother, but without the drive to achieve anything with it. The first time he meets Watson in The Greek Interpreter, he astonishes him by out-deducing Sherlock. In the Bruce Partington plans, we learn that Mycroft plays a significant role in the British government of the time. Sherlock calls him the most indispensable man in the country. The only other things about Mycroft that are certain are that he is very fat and a member of the Diogenes Club, where conversation is forbidden. <laughs> Patrick's typescript began where Doyle had left off. It consisted of three stories which delved into the absent personality of Mycroft. As impatient as I was to read them, I was conscious of my obligations to Patrick. Before beginning, I made some tea to sober me up. I found a comfortable chair in the library. I moved a standard lamp to give me the right degree of light. The yellow bulb spawned a twin in the rain-swept window behind it. The first completed story, The Fairy Feller's Masterstroke, found Mycroft back in London. He's trying to help rehabilitate the crazy painter, Richard Dorimant, who has been put in an insane asylum after murdering his father. Mycroft petitions the governors of the asylum to allow Dorimant to exhibit his work. However, when Mycroft finally succeeds, the weird new paintings confirm the judgment that Dorimant is completely bonkers. Among the VIPs invited to the exhibition are Sherlock and Watson. They and Mycroft find themselves standing, baffled, in front of a portrait of a bizarre-looking mythical beast which is in the process of ingesting a human corpse. This is how the story ends. The doctor paused before the canvas, his gaze fixed on the organs of the fanged beast, which appeared visible through an opening on the crown of its head. The beast's tubes must serve some purpose, cried the doctor. My brother looked at me in bafflement. Alimentary, my dear Watson, I said. The last line makes me think of one of those replica guns that fire a flag saying bang. Patrick seems to have based Dorimant on the mad Victorian painter Richard Dadd. In the second story, The Duelist, Mycroft goes to visit the painter Horace Vernet in Paris. Vernet, 1789 to 1863, was a real French painter whom Doyle claimed was Sherlock's maternal uncle. Horace needs to get some money for a purpose that is never made clear and takes Mycroft with him to the apartment of an old Russian emigre by the name of Dantes. 
The description of Dantes, who is attended by an elderly lady called Yelena Gravanova, was one of the funniest things I'd read in the stories so far.